In this episode, Golden and I discuss Lucifer, Season 6, Full Speed Ahead. The Omega Beam, Full Power. The Omega Beam. Welcome to the Omega Beam, number 148. I'm your host, Oren Merton. So here we are, Lucifer, Season 6, The final season of the entire series, streaming worldwide on Netflix. Now, we've been following this show from the very beginning, so here we are for the very end. We sort of go into spoilers later in the podcast, so if you haven't seen season six and you don't want anything spoiled, then you'll want to watch the show before listening to our discussion of it. And with that said, let's get to it. I am here with Golden to talk about Lucifer Season 6, which is also the series finale, not just the uh, season finale. Which we weren't even sure was going to happen. Yeah, originally they were picked up for by, by Netflix. For and, Season 5. For Season 5. And we thought that was going to be it. Yeah, but apparently Season 5, they were so happy with it. They were like, yeah, we can give you another season to finish up. I mean, they were so sure that Season 5 was it that... Kevin Alejandro was okay with his character dying. Exactly. By the way, there will be spoilers. That was a spoiler from season five. That was only a couple months ago. That's true. They did air like right on the back of the other, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. So basically, if you have not watched Lucifer yet, come back and listen to this after. The only thing that we will say before we actually get into it is that... I believe that this is a series that took off from the beginning and landed well. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. And I expected from, I would say, halfway through that final episode, there was very little that I didn't think was going to happen that didn't happen. I agree, and it's... And I was was good with that. Yeah, it's okay. absolutely fine with that. This is comfort food. This show is comfort food. It's not about giving you something you don't know there, what yeah. it is. It's about giving it to you in a way that you really like. There doesn't have to be a surprise ending for something to be fulfilling. Yeah, absolutely. And I really felt like Lucifer ended the way it needed to end. Yeah. Everyone's arc ended nicely. Everyone gets their due. Should there's, we go into spoilers now? There's only one thing that didn't come at the end, which I really wish would have, but I'm okay with the alternate version of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. I know what you're going to say, and, and we can get into that too. So anyway, as uh, Golden said, if you haven't seen it yet, if you haven't watched Lucifer at all, please do. You're really going to like it. If you've watched up to season five and you were just waiting to hear if, if season six is worth seeing, it absolutely is. And uh, I think we might as well get into spoilers already. And even my saying a certain character dies. That happened last season, so. It, hey, you know, some, some characters have died and come back, so. You know, it's fantasy. Remember yeah. that this is fantasy. So, yeah. Getting into spoilers, three, two, one spoilers. You mean, I had read before... Season six began that even though Kevin Alejandro was technically Dan's character, Dan, yeah, Dan, even though Dan had died, that they had found a way and not just okay, we'll just throw him in. It was a significant and there was a good reason for him to be there, right? And and his character literally moves the plot, yes. So it it was not just, oh, we want him in the last season because he's been part of the whole show. Which means they didn't really know how it was going to end, but they figured out how. Yeah, but they figured, well, you know, that's that's the sign of a creative writer's room, that they're given a set of problems, a set of issues, a set of termination points, if you will, at the end of season five. And then they're, they're given one more season to really wrap everything up nicely in a bow. And so they were able to take all those termination points and come up with 10 episodes that moved and were really good. And I like Brianna Hildebrand. I mean, I've been a fan of her since Deadpool. Oh, yeah, yeah. And this She's is... She's fantastic. She really brought... Her, she brought it to Lucifer. She brought her A-game. I yeah. mean, she's a good actress in general, but... This was really good. I mean, she really got to run the emotional gamut. She did not play a one-note character, and she absolutely helped make season six shine 
in a beautiful, beautiful way. And I still kind of like that one of the people that really created the paths for five and six with this question of who should be God was was Rob Benedict's character, Vincent, De- Vincent Lamarck, uh. <laughs> because of his role in Supernatural, where he basically mm. is God in writing the story. Sure, sure. And for him to kind of help be God in that and then helping to be decide who's going to be God in this. A little bit stunt very, casting, uh, but it worked. It worked well. I thought well. it was great. Yeah. I would also add that every season has had a different overarching like storyline, whether it's been Eve is back or who's going to be God or whatever. There's always a sort of general overarching theme to each season. And this one, first of all, it was, okay, someone has to be God now. But then also, like you brought up, it was Brianna Hildebrandt. Lucifer and Chloe's daughter comes back from the future, and she's really, really upset. I mean, she comes back wanting to kill Lucifer. And it becomes this almost mystery of, huh? What's that all about? And I thought it un it un unraveled, unwind, unwound. I don't know exactly what the perfect, came undone. Well, came, yeah, it did. It developed in an developed. incredibly organic, good well, way. If you're gonna talk about themes, I think between five and six, there's this theme of the fact that nothing can be stagnant. That there needs to be changes. That you cannot keep going with the same old thing. Just because that's what you've been doing for hundreds of years. Yeah. And I think this whole series, I mean, this isn't just a season six thing, but I think this whole series has had kind of this overarching theme of redemption that characters, well, obviously the devil can be redeemed, but, you know, the character that Trisha um, Helfer. Helfer plays, that's, you know, this horrible lawyer and then is, you know, possessed and then becomes herself again, but realizes she has to be a better person. There's this theme, even Dan, Dan was a dirty cop, and he's he's redeemed. There's this theme for the entire series oh, yeah, of Lucifer, yeah, of of redemption. And I think it is played really beautifully. And they never hit you over the head with it at the very conclusion, of course, where they really want to make sure you, you know, their parting shots at the end of the season, they do make it very clear and they do make sure it's in your face, but it's it's in a way that makes sense for the story. It's not overdone, you know, and this is about redemption. And I think I think one of the reasons this is such a fun fantasy show is that no matter how dark some episodes may get, you always know that is this is not a grim show. This is a positive show. So you're saying that, and I'm just imagining Maze just chasing down a bad guy with this big grin <laughs> on her face. I get to do this. I know. It's like she's, this is a creature who was literally born to torture, and yet even she has found a way to take those skills well, then, and make them positive. And again, though, you talk about redemption. Yeah. And even though she was born a demon... She's found a greater purpose. And in her case, she not just evolves intellectually and emotionally, but she she evolves a soul. That's quite something. You know, the mythology of the show is demons don't have souls. And yet we're told point blank in season five, she's got one now. And you have characters that are extremely hurt when it isn't what the truth actually is. But the fact that you wouldn't tell your friend the truth right. and have faith that that person would still love you, acknowledge you, be your friend, stand by your side. Right. Yeah. I'm guessing you're uh, referring to Miss Lopez and the fact I that am. she's like... Poor Miss Lopez, who... She's, yeah, she's the one who doesn't know. has the worst luck in guys right. for, <laughs> for a good portion of the series. Yeah, the worst luck in guys. <clears throat> and at a certain point, she is, I think, literally the only one of the main cast who has not been informed 
that Lucifer is the literal devil and Aminadil is a literal angel. But she doesn't need angel. to be informed because she's able to figure it out. Yeah, she does figure. I mean, she, you know, these guys are investigators. She just loses her shit about it at one particular time and makes it even more interesting and funny. Yeah, but I, I was going to say that I like the way they did that because, as as I've said on this podcast before, as Golden knows so well, the kind of way that sort of secret identities get revealed in, in comic related stories is one of my pet peeves because so obviously, you know, come on glasses, really you're going to hide yourself from the world. I mean, but she really is that smart. Yeah. And so I, I like the fact that even though no one told her the big reveal, it would have been nice she figured it out. for her to have like a little flashback though, to what Amenadiel was like with the nuns. And how they treated him. Right. Be like, oh, yeah, I got you now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, this Lucifer. is <clears throat> very recommended. And, and we're going to miss it. Yeah, definitely. This is absolutely one of those shows. All the actors, you know, Tom, Tom Ellis, Laura German, the ones who've been, uh, Leslie Ann Bryant, who've been playing these characters for so many years now. They inhabit these characters. They... And, and hey, it's a show that has more uh, basically male nudity than female nudity. Yeah, there, I don't think there's – I don't think there was ever any female nudity in this show. Only, you know, Tom Ellis's bum a number of times. But, you know, he's, he's proud of his incredibly chiseled figure. So, you know, why not? If you're happy and want to show it, show your bum. <laughs> Pretty much. If you're happy and want to show it, show your yeah. bum. No, he's a good-looking guy. There's a lot of lot of ladies who like this show specifically, and men too, probably, who who like this show because he is a, you know, they found a very good-looking guy to play the devil. Well, he's got that, that charm. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, not, not, just it's, the, it's not, not just the body. Yeah. It's that and it's he not his has the personality. It's not necessarily well. his physique or his overall looks. It's the whole package. Yeah. Pun intended. Oh, man. No, you know, actually, one, no pun intended. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that, you know, we've seen him in, in Comic-Con as well. He seemed absolutely charming and incredibly friendly in, in real life. But everything I've ever read about Tom Ellis is that he took his role as sort of number one on the call sheet very seriously and was very grateful, present to the fans. He's a very, you know, created a very warm environment to act in. People like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill myself for not remembering his full name. Tom Super, Smallville, the leader of, you know, Clark Kent in Smallville, who played Adam, or not Adam, who played Kane. I'm blanking on his name and I'm feeling very dumb about it. Especially because we just saw him on DC Fan. Tom Welling. Tom Welling, thank you. Yeah, you know, we literally just saw him weeks ago in DC Fandom. But yeah, he's gone on to. I've heard him on the podcast with you know Michael Rosenbaum talking about just what a wonderful group of people. It's just very supportive and kind, and you can you it, it comes across. It it's one of those things where the positive attitude that they bring to the show that they bring to each other gets on the show. And and now we're going to kind of go back because, I mean, Lucifer was kind of born of Sandman. He, yeah, he wasn't kind of born of Sandman. And I'm just he saying. He was legitimately born in, within the game of Sandman. There's been a lot of controversy over the casting of Lucifer for the new Sandman. I think, I think and, the casting was perfect. And it's great, though, because yeah. who's to say that Lucifer is always male? Right. Lucifer can, I mean, he can manifest whatever physical form he wants, right? So I think them breaking away and going with with Gwendolyn Christie for Lucifer for the Sandman series is nice because it really kind of separates these two and right. shows that this is the Lucifer for this time and that's going to be the Lucifer in that time. Right. That this the, this is is not in any way the Lucifer series in no way is connected to Neil Gaiman's Sandman series, and I think except like for him being born out of it. Right. Except for the fact that they have the same ultimately the same source material. To DC's Legends of Tomorrow. That's right. That's right. Because Tom Tom Ellis did a cameo. That was a 
That was a lot of fun. I love that. But then I've I've said on this podcast repeatedly how much I thought Crisis of Infinite Earths was really just the question is such a fantastic victory lap. And and I haven't read all of the Sandman. Uh huh. Does Constantine show up? Oh yeah. And if so, are they just going to use Matt Ryan? Oh no, they already aren't. They oh, they, they already aren't. they they already oh. cast their Sandman. Matt Matt Ryan's Constantine. So they're gonna. Use a different Constantine for Sandman? Correct. Okay. They, ca- I believe they said they cast him. Yeah, and, and Constantine comes in early. I mean, I think Constantine is in the, the first... that would have been fun. I think he's the first six books. Yeah, you know, I'm well, betting... Then I, I have seen... I have read that part. Yeah, so, I, I you know, he. I'm pretty sure that you've you've seen Constantine in, in the early part of Sandman. But I get why they didn't use Matt Ryan... I love Matt Ryan. He is Constantine as far as I'm concerned, but it would it would be a distraction because this is clearly not part of the CW Arrowverse and they don't want that kind of of uh connection to, you know, be part of the thing. Yeah, you know, interestingly they could have theoretically brought uh, Constantine into the Lucifer show, not just Lucifer into Crisis on Infinite Earth. But I think they did it right by by not bringing him into the show. I mean, this show is a sort of self-contained thing. And I, I, I really like it. I mean, as a six-episode, or six-episode, as a six-season series, from soup to nuts, you can watch the entire thing streaming on Netflix. And it is it is enjoyable. You know, a lot of shows... They sort of start awkwardly, and then they get good at a certain point, and then maybe they start getting bad. The thing about Lucifer is it it never was bad. It leaned into the humor more once they got it, I think, past season one, maybe season two. But the humor started, or it was always a little bit funny, but in the beginning, it was always just a drama with quips. But they very quickly realized that their strength was making it a fantasy, quote-unquote, dramedy. And they leaned into it after those early seasons, which are still fun and still good. And it never got bad. It never had a bad season. There was never a season of Lucifer I would say, yeah, you can skip that one. Or, yeah, that's when everyone was just kind of pulling paychecks. No, it was always good. The writers were always coming up with interesting things. For the characters to do interesting new twists for everything, while at the same time, like we're talking about with redemption and everything else, keeping the same overarching themes and ideas that they they had from day one, and that's not easy to do. Yeah, but it was, and it was like you said, it was good through all the seasons. If you didn't catch Lucifer. There is nothing that we said that I think is going to spoil your enjoyment of it. Exactly. Just buckle in and go for a fun ride. Yeah, and and know that as hard as it is to stick the landing of a series, and if you really want to hear me wax about a, a series that that ended with a 20-minute, the last 15 minutes being so bad that people are saying it killed the whole series— meaning Troll Hunters, go back a few episodes and hear what we said about Troll Hunters Rise of the Titans where, boy, they almost stuck the landing, but then at the last minute they fumbled both feet. Whereas this one, it sticks the landing. And exactly as you said, you had brought up that it would have been great if after sort of the deception that turns the daughter into the person she was and she goes back and in time, but then she realizes it had to be that way and makes him promise to keep it that way. It would have been oh, great. Oh, see, that's what they could have done, is they could have just backed out and you know how we saw them from down the corridor a little bit? Mm. If they had backed up just a little bit more and she was leaning around the corner watching, that would have been... Yeah, they that would have been even more sweet. Yeah, and the one thing they didn't do is bring Rory, Lucifer, and Chloe, and Chloe at the very end. The three of them together. That's why I said if she had just been like peeking yeah. around the corner and she saw them there. Right, but like you said, it doesn't matter that we've said all these things because 
the great thing about comfort food is, you know, when say what they were doing. If (laughs) if you want a potato chip, when you open the bag, it's not a surprise what you're getting, and you're still gonna love it. And that's the thing about Lucifer. This isn't the kind of series where the twists are like overwhelming and and that you're going to be talking about, oh my God, I can't believe this happened. This isn't that kind of show. I saw the headline of a news article, something about people are finding potato chips inside Reese's peanut butter cups. That would be a surprise. Yeah, You bite into a Reese's peanut butter cup and instead it's crunchy because it's potato chips. Yeah, that would be a surprise. But no no potato... This is not a Reese's peanut butter cup. I was going to say, no potato chips in these Reese's peanut butter cups. It is what you expect it to be, and it is absolutely delicious. And if this is what you like, you're going to get it, and you're going to like it, because they do such a a wonderful, heartwarming, funny, and yet still dramatic and emotional and job with it. this is a cast that I, I'm i sure really cares about each other off. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you follow social media and everything, you know that these are people who respect each other incredibly deeply. But even even so, even without that, I think, like you said, it's it's pretty obvious. I mean, they they just really really seem to get along incredibly well. So basically, watch Lucifer. It's exactly, worth it. watch Lucifer. Well, thank you, Golden. You're welcome. And that's it for this episode. You can find the show notes at theomegabeam.com/slash one forty eight. If you like this episode, please leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Your reviews help people who like this stuff find our podcast. If you have any comments or suggestions, please drop us a line at info at theomegabeam.com. Be good to yourselves and each other, and we'll catch you next time. The Omega Beam, full stop.